All right, today's topic, theme, doing the inner work. So doing the inner work. Now, I chose this topic because I've lived here in Bali for like 14, 15 years. And in all that time, some of you are like, what? People exist like that? 14, 15 years in Bali? In all that time, what I've noticed is we have this beautiful conscious community here. People come here to heal, to grow, to transform. And how many of you have ever heard of the 80-20 rule in life? There's a lot of different places we apply it, right? You've heard this. And it applies here too, that 80% of the people who come here for certain reasons end up just being distracted and doing other things and having a good time. But only 20% actually do the work. Because self-discovery, personal transformation, personal development, self-development, it's not something that just happens because you went to an event or just one class, maybe in this one, sometimes it happens. But really, it's the commitment that you make to a container of practice. It's what I love about being in a yoga studio is that's the whole point, right? You come into yoga not so you can do it once and you're like, okay, I did it, I checked it off my list, I'm done. <laughs> but it's so you learn a practice. And it's the same with every single question or inquiry and self-reflection that you might have as you start to journey into and through the heart. It's not that you're going to find an answer today and then that's it, you got it now, now you can just continue the rest of your days with that answer. It changes all the time. And it's changing not just because you're changing and the environment's changing and the world is changing, but it's changing also because sometimes we're not dealing with just the heart, we're dealing with the stories we've placed upon it. You guys know what I mean? We're constantly putting layer upon layer of experience, history, memory, sometimes trauma, sometimes triumph. Whatever it is, we're putting it on top and then all of a sudden we find ourselves in this place where we're not feeling like we're connected to our hearts anymore. Any of you can relate? Yeah, yeah. And when we start to actually pierce through those veils and those layers, emotion might come up. I want to say that it's a very safe space here to let that emotion come up. It's a beautiful thing about Ubud in general. You can be in a cafe or on your Gojek or in a class and emotion starts to come up. Just let it come up. People are going to look over and be like, yeah, good on you. (laughs) Hmm. I want to make sure I actually hit record. (laughs) So we start to look at what does it mean to do the deep inner work? And I guess the opposite of that would be when we bypass. You guys have heard of spiritual bypass, right? And I think spiritual bypass is when it's similar to a bypass on a freeway. You've got a direction you're going. You're like, okay, I'm going there. And then maybe there's construction or something going on. And so what a bypass on a freeway does or a highway, it takes you around the work, right? There's construction work being done. And it's like, oh, no, here, take this detour in life. Go on over here, you know, see some scenery, and then you come back around on the other end, like everything's fine. But the real trick of life is not that you just get to the end, I mean, that would just make our lives short, right? But it's that you experience the journey on the way there. And that means sometimes going through the work, the construction work, the the maintenance, the practices, the feelings. And a lot of times the inner work is you start to go in and you start to try to figure out, okay, who am I? Where am I? What am I doing? What's next? How many of you are here in Bali because you're like, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. (laughs) I don't know where I'm going and and I'm trying to figure it out. What's, where am I going to go next? Maybe at a fork in the road and trying to choose. Hmm. Trying to find your purpose maybe. That's always an interesting one to me. People ask me all the time, either in these talks or in private coaching, they're like, how do I find my purpose? How do I figure out what I'm supposed to be doing? And I say, well, what do you think your purpose is? They're like, I don't know. I just know I, I came here to do something big and great and to change the world. Okay, well, that's cool. It's a lot of pressure. <laughs> but you know what it is? No idea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I like to say that rather than thinking you have a purpose, Do everything on purpose. Do everything on purpose. Be intentional about what you're doing, right? Because when you do that, all of a sudden, the purpose, the intention, the clarity with which you are living comes from that deep place of that, we're not even calling it the inner work, but the inner source that starts to guide you, not because you thought, that's what I'm supposed to do, but that's because you felt, that's what I want to do. Notice the word I just used, want. 
How many of you have been trained to think that wants and desires are taboo? That you're not supposed to prioritize those things. Right? You know, no, no, I'm supposed to do the things I'm supposed to do, need to do, have to do. And then once I've done that, proven myself worthy, struggled through it, then I can ask maybe about the things that I want to do or even consider them. I'm going to give you guys a little flip today. I want you to do the opposite. There will always be things that you need to do. But you see, we confuse needs and wants all the time. And this is why we end up having to do so much inner work because we've taken the things that are needs. Needs are always survival-based. If you need something, it's because you're either going to live or die if you don't do it. You're in the middle of the road, semi-truck's coming at you. You need to move. Get out of that road. But almost everything else is a want. It's a desire. But we've denied that to ourselves. And so, because we're human beings and desires and wants are very powerful in us, when they come up, we're like, well, I can't just want it, so I'll say I need it. Yes, I need that thing. I need to go to that yoga class. I need that chocolate cake at the cafe. I need to know that person. Right? All these different things that come up and we label it as need. And here's the problem. When it wasn't really a survival thing, but we make it a survival thing, then all of a sudden our brain gets active and it's like, wait, okay, we need this. If I need to meet that person, right? And if I don't, I'm going to die. My brain's going to focus on that and it's going to start to create all sorts of conditions. Reasons why I have to work hard to prove myself worthy of that person, prove myself worthy of a job, prove myself worthy of that cake. Whatever it is that you want, but you've made it a need, all of a sudden your mind starts trying to get you to make yourself worthwhile or enough for it. Because really you're just trying to survive at that point. It's the same with money. That's a big one, right? Money conversation. Hmm. But what if instead we could relax around it and say, oh wait, I don't need that. I just, I want that. It's something I want, right? Our needs are an exaggeration often of our wants. And so if you start to key into your wants, you can start to do the inner work quite easily because you start to guide yourself with a clarity that isn't placed upon with all these layers of pressure and stress and proving. When that gets released, oh my God, things get real easy. The self-discovery, self-development journey can be one like you're on a raft and you're just floating down the stream if you can surrender to it. But most of us don't surrender. Half the work is actually releasing resistance. Isn't that funny? Half the work is releasing resistance. We've probably all heard the term growing pains, right? That you know, when you're growing, you go into new things and, and there's like a painful period of it. And I will credit my wife for this because she's looking at me like, is he going to take credit? Is he going to take credit? We were having this conversation the other day and she's like, you know what I think? I don't think it's growing pains. I think it's releasing pains. I thought that was amazing. It's releasing pains. It's when we finally let go of something. It's so hard sometimes, isn't it? To let go of the identities, the possessions, the obsessions, the everything that we've been holding on to an attachment. To release it, we have to trust. And sometimes we even think to ourselves, yeah, but I can't because then it'll make it like it wasn't worthwhile. It'll make it like there was no value. It'll make it like it was all in vain, especially if you suffered. Especially if it was a challenge. Can I tell you guys a story? I like telling stories. With my clients, I'm always like, okay, that's just stories. Let them go. Here's some new ones. <laughs> so several years back, I was climbing a mountain called Mount Whitney. It's in the continental U.S. It's the tallest peak over there. And it was with a bunch of buddies of mine, and it took us like four days to get to the top. And when we reached the summit, it was this moment of triumph. It was like, oh, yes. And I remember looking down, and I saw this little rose quartz up there on the summit. And I thought, ooh. I'm going to take that as a, as a memory, a remembrance of this moment, this achievement in my life. Because I struggled to get up here, and I want to remember it. So I took it, and I put it in my pocket. We started to walk down. And the way down was these switchbacks, which means that it goes back and forth. And at every corner, there was a lot more stuff, because they kind of clear the path all the time. So there's new stones and twigs and other things that are over there. And, and so each corner, I'd be like, oh, that's really nice, too. I'll, I'll take that. 
And then over here, oh, I'll take a little bit of that. This is what we do in life, right? We're walking along life, and every time something happens, good or bad, and it's often more the bad, we take it as a little memory piece and we put it in our pockets. And it weighs us down a little bit. And we keep walking. By the time I got down to the bottom of the mountain, I looked like a chipmunk because I was wearing these cargo pants and I had like pockets full here, pockets full here, pockets full here. My backpack had a few things in it. I, I'm a skinny guy, so you know, my, my pants were starting to drop down. I was wearing flip-flops. Bad idea when you're hiking a mountain. And so I was like waddling down. I'm like, gotta make it. Almost there. Can make it. Can. And me and my buddies would get all the way to the bottom and there's a park ranger down there and she came up just to congratulate us. Say, hey, good job. You guys, you know, made it. I, I know you started a few days back. She's shaking everybody's hand. She gets to me and she's like, good job. What do you have in your pocket, sir? What are, what are you carrying there? And I was proud because we're proud of our challenges. We're proud of our struggles. We're proud of the emotions we're holding deep inside and we don't want to let go of. And she said to me, because I told her, I was like, oh, I'm taking some memorabilia. And I took it out. I was so proud. I'm showing her all these stones and different things that I was, had taken. And she goes, well, that's, that's a wonderful idea. But we have a policy here at the park. I was like, what, what's the policy? What are you talking about? And she said, what you find in nature, you leave in nature. And I just kind of stood there like, you're not serious, right? <laughs> Because we don't want to face the facts. We don't want to do the inner work because sometimes it's challenging to the identity we've created through the struggle. We're like, no, no, you can't take that away from me. But she did. So I had to empty all my pockets out. I started to walk away and she's like, sir, the backpack as well. Like, Boom, come on. Because we always save a little bit, right, for a rainy day so that when, when we're having a real negative day, we have something to complain about. Don't do that. Let it all go. And that's what she gave me the opportunity to do. And you know what I felt when I finally took everything out of my pockets, all of the stuff out of the backpack? Exactly. I felt so much lighter. It's amazing. So there's these layers that we've been accumulating throughout life. And that's what the inner work is really about. It's releasing those layers. Letting go of everything you've started to carry as a weight and a burden. It's the extra baggage. How many of you brought more stuff than you needed when you got here to Bali? Right? <laughs> People are laughing. They're like, yeah, paid extra at the airport for it too. You realize you get here, all you need is like a sarong, some yoga clothes, you're done. <laughs> but we're always carrying so much extra baggage. Even those of you who just laugh right now, you probably have storage bins at home, don't you? You're holding stuff there and you're not using it. And you're going to be out here traveling for the next year. And here's the thing, what most people do, and this is part of the, what we do, I say unconsciously in the inner work, it's the same thing as if you had a storage bin at home or storage um, unit and you go back home, it's been a year, maybe two years, you haven't even looked in there, you didn't even think about it. You don't remember what's in that thing. But you get home and you're only there for like a couple weeks and you're thinking to yourself, I only have a couple weeks to go through every single item in every box in there to see if I want to keep it or not. Why? Why are you going through it if you've not thought, needed, looked at, done anything with any of that stuff for that long? It means it's not significant in your life presently. What would happen if you could just let it go? See, we make the inner work hard because we want to look at every single piece of emotion, of uh, memory, of struggle, of challenge. And we want to take it under a magnifying glass and try to figure out, okay, why did that happen to me? What could I do different? How can I protect myself from that? Oh, here's a tricky thing. A lot of us were taught when we were growing up that you needed to know your history so that you wouldn't make the same mistakes, right? I think that's a lie. That's like looking at the reflectors on the side of the highway and you're like, okay, I'm just going to focus there. If you're focused on the things that were challenges or the history that is stuff you don't want anymore, your avoidances, where well, you're telling your mind, your psyche, you're saying this is important. And your mind thinks that anything that's important or significant is for your survival. So what's it going to do? It's going to show you more opportunities to see things like that. So if you're trying to avoid heartbreak, you're going to look everywhere for where that could happen. You're going to get into a new relationship. You'll be like, everything's great, but I'm just waiting. I know, I know this is going to end badly. It always does. Right? 
We've all been there. You have to start to make new choices in your life that are not from the old reflections, but are from the new desires and clarity that lead you to something so much better than your history because it's something that you are creating and cultivating instead of simply settling for or trying to avoid something worse. That's often what I see people doing actually in life. They're trying to avoid something instead of moving towards something. Now I ask all my clients when I do one-on-one coaching, I say, what do you want? And they go, well, I, I don't want to suffer anymore. I just, I, I don't want heartbreak and I don't want to be sick or and I don't want to be poor and I don't want, and I'm like, whoa, <laughs> that's everything you don't want. What do you want? What do you want to move towards? What do you want to add to your life? And they're like, uh, uh, I, what? <laughs> Confuses people when you ask them that question. And I know what happens. I can see it even in some of your faces right now. I ask that question, what do you want? And there's a little voice in the back of your mind that's like, but I can't have it. I don't deserve it. I'm not done enough or I've not made amends for the mistakes that I made in my past when I wasn't knowing that I was making a mistake. I want you to think about that, what I just said. If you're judging yourself for choices you made in the past when you didn't know that it wasn't going to be the best choice, when you weren't aware of all the possibilities that you could have chosen from, why are you being hard on yourself? Just don't make those choices again. <laughs> but don't judge yourself for before. Because when you do that, that little voice comes up and it doesn't let you make a new choice. It starts to make you think that that's who you are, was that choice. That your history is making you who you are. That's another one of those fallacies that people say that, that your past makes you who you are. Your past brings you to where you are. Your choices make you who you are. Your past brings you to where you are. Your choices make you who you are. And in every single moment, you can make a new choice. And it's as powerful as if you were to go home, see your storage bin, give the facility manager your key and be like, can you just empty it out, sell it off, whatever you can. I'm done with all of that. You don't have to go through it all. This makes the inner work much simpler. But now again, we look at bypass. Now that doesn't mean that you act like it's okay already. It means you start to cultivate a new garden. Right? For a lot of years, many of us unconsciously have been planting seeds of doubt, insecurity, not enoughness, not worthy. We've been creating all these places that were anchors and holding us back. And they made attachments in our identity they created fears and insecurities. Just because you cut the top of the weeds away doesn't mean that they went away. They're probably still there, some of them. And so you might think, okay, so we got to dig in, really dig into it and start to get them out. Yes, yeah, somewhat. But what you get to do even more powerfully? Plant new seeds, the ones you want. Because the seeds that you plant and nurture and give your attention to and your love and, and your attention and nurturing all of a sudden, those start to grow. And your garden starts to be filled with the flowers and the fruits of what you want rather than the weeds that you were avoiding. I invite you as you do the inner work, don't focus on the avoidances or the challenges or the things that you're afraid of or the self-judgments and all the stuff that you're trying to change. Acknowledge it, yes. But don't invest in it. Acknowledge it and then invest in the things that you want. That's what the real inner work is. It's to start to give yourself permission to move towards the life that you desire. You know, I'm saying just make choices as if it's an easy thing. It's not always. But it's not because the choice isn't easy. Choices are always easy. But what layers have been placed upon your ability to make that choice? And those are going to be the layers of your past conditioning. Those are going to be the layers of your self-judgments. That's going to be the layers also of the protective walls and barriers that you put up. Right? You always see these medieval pictures where they have all the armor and all this stuff and all these shields. And then in the movies, they're like running like it's nothing. Right? I'm pretty sure that back then they were like, I'm coming for you. Because <laughs> that stuff's heavy. We don't need to be carrying so many of the protective defense mechanisms that we tend to. 
Now that's not to say that you shouldn't be creating boundaries, but do it with your clarity, not with barriers. How do you get rid of these unconscious, these blind spots, right? You start becoming conscious of it. So one of the first things, actually there's two first things that I'll mention here. Very, very first thing you wanna do when you're doing any kind of inner work, create a safe space. Make sure that you have a sense of safety, a container where you can dedicate the time, the energy, and know that, that you're supported within that. So often people are trying to make new choices while they're still in a place of, that doesn't feel safe. I can use a job as an example. A lot of people come to Bali after being burnt out in a job, corporate or wherever there are, right? And for years they were trying to make a new choice while still staying in the job. Still in the mentality that, but if I leave this I won't be able to pay my bills and I'll, I'll be homeless and, and starve to death. That keeps you in a place of unsafety. Right? Now it might mean that you decrease the expenses and the things that you need so that you create that space for yourself. Or maybe you take a two week vacation to Bali just to give yourself a bubble of time to start to process things and find clarity. Right? So first step, you find safety. Create safety for yourself. That's key. Now once you do that, the next step is to start to become aware of all the possibilities that you weren't aware of before. How many of you, while well, you've been here in Bali, you've suddenly been looking around, you're like, wait, people can live like that? They can, they can just be happy for no reason? They can twist like that? Like, right, there's so much stuff that we start to look around, we're like, things are possible. Whoa. And then you can ask yourself, is it possible for me? A little voice in the back of your mind is going to be like, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> And I'm going to say something here that's a little counterintuitive. How many of you, when, when that question's posed, is it possible for me, the little voice in your mind says, no way. No, I can't do that. I got it. No way. Right? And that's because a lot of us have this unfortunate mindset and repeating little voice that says, I'm not enough. But that voice is never mine. Oh, did you hear what she said? She said, but that voice is never mine. So true. Oh, I love that. That voice is never yours. It's always some conditioning, some external authority, most of the time meaning good. They didn't mean to squash you. Sometimes, but not always. And you took it on as your identity and you're like, oh, okay, I'm not enough. And here's the counterintuitive thing. I'm going to say, it's true. You're not enough. But not because of who you are. If you are 100% authentically expressing as you, well, the math is there. You're enough. It's 100%. But most of us are not at 100%. We have fragmented and separated and divided ourselves up into so many different pieces. And we've made it into roles and barriers and bricks in the walls. And moments of our history and projections of our future. And it's every single time that we invested a piece of ourselves, especially into those voices that were not our own, into the authorities that were not our own choice, that we gave away a power or a piece of ourselves. And then we look back at what's left and there's only like 10, 15%. Of course, the voice is going to say, that's not enough. And so for me, the definition of healing is reintegrating, bringing it all back re-empowering yourself by bringing back the pieces of who you are and have always been. We're going to take it another level up though. It's not even that you were ever fragmented. That was all an illusion too. It's just a story. It's as if I took this glass right now. Right now it looks like it's a whole beautiful piece of glass, transparent and clear. We see this gorgeous view, right? And that's what life could be like. But what if I start to draw shapes and lines and cracks and all this stuff on it. All of a sudden you think, well that is broken now. And how many of you said that about yourself? Especially as you begin the inner work. It's probably why you started doing the inner work. You're like, I need to fix something. No, you don't. Nothing is broken. There is an illusion that something is broken. That's one of the layers, one of the stories. As you start to become aware, not only of the possibilities that are around you, you also start to become aware of the things that you don't need to keep investing your attention in. And you start to let go. Automatically, naturally, gently. And this is also one of the big questions people ask, like, well, how? How do I let go? Stop holding on. 
It seems so simple, right? How do I let go? Stop holding on. Everything in life is moving through. It's on its way in and out. But we as human beings, we have a tendency to hold on to things. We become attached because we get a sense of control, security, sometimes even safety from holding on and feeling like we, we understand it. But let me give you this example. Let's say that you were at one of the fruit markets here and you were given a free banana. Sometimes they do that. You get some fruits and then the vendor will be like, oh, thank you, and they give you a little free extra something. Right? And so you get one of these little bananas, like little sweet bananas. And you get it and you're like, oh, so sweet. I really want to remember that gesture. It's so nice. I'm going to put it in my backpack and I'm going to keep it there. I'm going to remember it forever, the, how kind this person was. A week goes by. You kind of forgot about the banana. But you're starting to smell something. You don't know what it is. <laughs> when we hold on to anything, even the sweet stuff, it eventually rots. We cannot hold on. We have to allow things to pass through our lives. But that doesn't mean that you are constantly losing something. It means you then get to put your attention on cultivating that coming back into your life. Or even becoming better in your life. Christina and I do a lot of relationship coaching for people. And that's one of the key aspects we talk about. That you don't get into a relationship and you're like, ha! I got the person, my work is done. Now that's when it begins. You cultivate the continuation of joy and happiness and love. And so we get to remember that things are just passing through. And I want to come back to this idea of choices and how do you really allow yourself to have choices. As you start to realize that there's actually more possibilities out there. And you start to realize that it's not that you're not enough and there's no external authority anywhere that's going to come along and stamp you as worthy. It's going to be a choice and a permission that you give yourself. You have to claim it. You have to say, I am enough. And the little voice will be like, yeah, but why? Because I said so. That's simple. Because who else is supposed to say it about you, right? Why are we waiting around for somebody else to be like, you know what? You're enough and you're enough. And you're, I'm still wondering about you. But you, you know, no, it doesn't work that way. You're the only one who can decide, you know what? As of today, I'm enough. I'm worthy. I can have anything that I want. Now, that doesn't mean that you can just go over and take somebody else's thing, right? What it means is that you have permission to start to cultivate it in your life, to take the actions and the steps to bring it into your life, not to take it. <laughs> How are you guys doing? You know, when we really think about it, and, and that comment of that voice is often not our own voice, it's, it's some voice from outside, but if we look at our family, and not always with family, but often the friends and the people we have around us, they're normally telling us we're enough, right? If you've got a good circle around you. But yet there's still some stubborn voice in there. And that voice is going to be from when you were anywhere between zero to seven years old, and it had nothing to do with you. Somebody said something, or maybe your parents were fighting and you thought that's my fault. Or it rained outside and you're like, I did that, right? Because when we're that young, we literally, it's called the heliocentric view of, the, of life, you think that everything is being caused because of you. It's just how we are at that point, because we haven't self-identified and separated ourselves from the rest of reality yet, that we think everything is being done because of our emotions, our attitude, our behaviors. Hmm. So, if that's happening, and because something that wasn't even related to you made you feel, I'm not enough, may not have even been a direct comment to you, that gets stuck in the hard wiring sometimes of our system and our psyche. It's like the motherboard of your brain. There's a few things actually, there's four primary ones that often are in there. This is from cognitive behavioral psychology. It's feeling